Ready. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Robin Nelson with another edition of Wrestle Popcast. And my guest today is Barbara Goodish, the widow of Bruiser Brody. How's it going? Well, thank you, Robin. It's a pleasure to be here. How about you today? I'm doing pretty good. Um, so what have you been up to lately during this crazy insanity that's going around? Well, that's easy to say. Nothing. <laughs> yeah, I'm the same. Really, you know, it, it's really, I mean, you get up in the morning. I mean, you do get catch up with things around the house that you have and then gardening and maybe take a little walk. And once every two weeks, you suit up and go to the grocery store. But that's about it. So it's really nice to have someone to talk to for a short time. I know. I like that, too. It just makes the day go by even better. <laughs> And we're six foot apart. Yeah, that's right. So let's uh, get into this. Um, you're from Australia. Um, tell me a little bit about growing up in Australia. Well, I was between uh, born in New Zealand but spent a lot of time in Australia. So you have to remember back in those days, uh, it was pretty simple. This was way back in the uh, early 50s. So it was a little different than what America was because we kind of didn't even have running water. We had, you know, water on a tank. There was a tank on the roof and when it rained, that was the water you used in the house. You didn't have an ice chest. The ice chest was somebody came around once a week with a chunk of ice, which always, I would watch the Three Stooges, and the three, if anyone remembers the Three Stooges, they had an episode with the guys carrying the ice upstairs. And that's exactly how it was. A big, they'd carry a big chunk of ice and put it in a little safe outside the house, and that's how you kept your eggs and your milk and everything. You never used a lot. Uh, you didn't have washing machines or dry. You had where well, you had to, you know, put everything in. No washing machine, a big old thing, and try to heat it up and stir it around, then put it through a little ring and hang it out on the line. So it was a little bit different growing up, even an old coal stove. And I'm sure people remember the party lines and the phones you never had your own line and think about when you think about the contrast what it is like today it's you can't even think of the contrast that shows you how old i am too (laughs) so um growing up were you um uh, big into pro wrestling never knew wrestling until 1978 when i when i worked in a hotel that had all the wrestlers from overseas would stay in this hotel. Just still didn't know wrestling. I just, as I, as I said, from working in the uh, hotel, we had to deal with them on a, you know, on a basis because it was the days when people would write letters. There wasn't no, t- you know, a toll call over to the states or wherever it was too expensive. So the families would write letters to each other with the photographs of the children growing up while the husband and father was away. And so we would get the mail and then we would hand it out. So they were kind of like our brothers, you know, with that, because we were kind of the step between being home. We would bring a little bit of home to them. And then they would read their mail and they would talk about their families and show us uh, their families and everything. So that was my first thing. I still didn't know anything much about wrestling. I just the uh, just the people, but they were just people. They weren't kind of like wrestlers back in those days. I bet you. That pre- was my first first step into the wrestling business was dealing on a day to day basis with the gentlemen that would come over from America to do the tours around New Zealand and Australia. I bet you probably had a lot of great stories and you probably learned a lot about the business by hanging out with some of those guys at the hotel. Right, because they, they were talking, like you said, there was the, from, from the midgets to the giants, it was, and it's just something I've done all my life. I have never, people sometimes judge you by how you are. I've always been, I've never judged a book by its cover and I've always with people how they treat me is how I treat them without I- anything else it's just you treat me you're my friend because you get to know people from inside not by what they look like 
so um, how'd you meet uh, Bruiser when he was in Australia? Well, that was kind of the same thing, because as I was talking about, we were the hotel that they all stayed at. So he was one of the people that were doing a tour in the Australia and New Zealand. So he was staying at the hotel. So as I said, it was just one of these cases where he became friends with a lot of them. And just one night, I just happened to be working the front desk on the 3 to 11 shift. Somebody had, you know, had not, couldn't turn up for work, so I volunteered to do the shift. And I was leaving at 11 o'clock. I was just finished up my shift at 11 o'clock when they all arrived back from a show that they'd done outside Sydney in Australia. And they just said, we, our boss happened to be the boss that owned a hotel in Sydney, also owned a uh, bar up the street and he was an American gentleman so when the boys came back they just said well how would you like to come up and you know have a drink with us so I said sure because you know if you work till 11 o'clock at night you can't unwind for a few hours when you work at five o'clock then you go home and you unwind a little bit before when you work you know when you work late yeah you tend to have a later night and uh so I just went up with them, and I think there was there was a well, that ten, twelve of us at the table. It was a huge, big table that uh, we had, and by one by one, each one began to leave. And it was like, okay, they'd get up and say, "We'll be back, we'll be back." In the finish, there were three of us. There was Killer Carl Crump, who's also passed. There was Frank, and then there was myself. Then Carl got up and left said, don't worry, I'll be right back. Of course, he never came back. Well, then that just left the two of us. So I found out later, it was a work. He had set this up because he didn't know how to get me by myself. So he had set it up with all the boys. Hey, we'll invite her up. You make sure you all leave. And that, so I got worked right from the very beginning. So that was a work. <laughs> That's great. So that, was, so that was how, and I'd already known him quite a while before that, just by, you know, seeing him in the hotel and doing work and everything. So, yeah, so we'd already become friends. And as you know, when when you become friends first, I think it's a much better base for a relationship because then you're yourself. You're not trying to be somebody else. I totally but sometimes when people go out on a date, they pretend to be they're putting on their best, you know, their best foot, so to speak, because uh, they're trying to impress the other person. When you're friends, you're not trying to impress anybody. You're just being yourself. And I think that's always a good way to start a relationship. I totally agree with you um, as well. And then finally, when you start becoming friends with Bruiser and you guys are, you know, uh, getting into each other. Um, when he was over in Australia, did you ever go uh, see him work in the ring? Nope. Never saw a wrestling match over there. Not at all. No, he'd, he'd go do his thing, come back, would see each other for a few hours and go out separate ways, come back and date. So, no, never did see a wrestling match. So, um, when you guys were dating and getting, you know, to be, you know, better friends, uh, what decided for you to go with him uh, back to the States? Well, it was just this one night. He'd been over there probably seven months or something, maybe even more. And he came back this night and he said, I'm, I'm leaving for home tomorrow. Because before that, everybody would say, oh, he's just using you. You know, he's going to go. He's going to forget. He's going to, you know, this is two different countries. Well, he came in when he said that, you know, I'm leaving for the States tomorrow. And he said, I want you to come over. And he put this, he knew I couldn't just leave the next day. Yeah. And he put this chunk of money that he'd been paid, you know, he'd been paid that night. And he left this money on the table and he said, I'm leaving tomorrow, but I would like you to come over. Well, okay. And if you've ever talked to anyone, Frank was very uh, studious with his money. Not tight, but he was very careful with his money. That's why that story goes with the green beans. That green beans and tuna that he would take on the road with him, save him going, spending money in a, uh, you know, in a restaurant. And it was good food. It was protein because he always thought about, you know, good. 
So I knew that he must trust me because of the fact that here was money. If he didn't, I could have just kept that money because it was a, quite a bit of money. In those days, I'm, I'm talking about this was 78 by this stage. I met him 77, that's right, 77. At this time, it's hard to get all the dates. Yeah, it was 77 he first came to Australia. It was 78 when he left to go back home. So that was quite a bit of money. So he didn't say anything except the only words were, I'd like you to come to Australia. Okay, there was no, oh, Australia, sorry. I'd like <laughs> you to come to America. So there were no promises. There was no, you know, saying this is going to happen. So I just thought, well, okay, if it doesn't work out, this would be a good chance to go see America. If it doesn't work out, I'll just go on to London, which I've always wanted. I've never been to London either yet because I'm still here. So it worked out that I would go on to, you know, London because, you know, you have to have another ticket out. So, no, that was it. I came over about 10. I tied up, tied up, you know, a lot of loose, loose ends that you do when you leave a country and came over about 10 days later. And like I said, I'm still here. So I guess it kind of worked out. That's pretty good. So what was your experience like when you came um, over uh, to uh, with a bruiser in the States? Um, what were you thinking? Um, what did you do first? <laughs> well, it was, as I said, it's a little scary. As I said, coming over, like I said, getting to the airport in Los Angeles. The first people that were at the airport, because these were the days when you could go up to the gate. And yeah. Meet the pla- you know, mm-hmm. meet people coming off the plane. The Hari, Hari Krishnas were there. And that was my first experience of America. I was getting off the plane and they were there and at the airport because I had to get another plane and go on to San Antonio. So got another plane, a little scary coming in, if someone was going to be there to meet you or not. And sure enough, there he was. When I arrived in San Antonio, there he was waiting. So that was, as I said, he was living with some friends of his, Pete and Roe, very good friends, and their two children. And uh, we stayed there, and in fact, I stayed there for quite some time before we got our own place, because even though I got there, he was still going, he was wrestling a lot in those days, so a lot of times I spent spend it with his friends, and he'd be off again. So, with me, you know, there was never uh, spending any long periods of time together, because he was always traveling. So since so that was so that was kind of ended up as I said living with his friends, which was good because I had somebody there to get used to, you know, just to find my way around and everything. So when you were in the states and um, uh, you know staying with him, when when did he pop the question about um, asking you uh, to marry him? Well, there was really no question. It didn't pop the question. All he said was he was going to Japan for six weeks, and he said, uh, hey, we can stop off in Vegas and get married. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> no. That was how he was. You know, there was no, no, there was no popping question. That, that was the popping of the question, and I didn't, I mean, so we found one of these little wedding chapels. So we flew into Vegas. He went to the gym while I was trying to find a wedding chapel and, you know, everything like that. And I found one that they they sent a limousine to the hotel. They took you to the courthouse. Then they took you to the chapel. Then they took you back to the uh, hotel. Pretty cheap, too. Didn't have a dress. Didn't have no rings. I forget what we used. And that was that was the marriage. <laughs> awesome. Um, so uh, when you uh, finally married him and, you know, when he was off, the, uh, off, you know, on the road to wrestling and over in Japan, which he wrestled a lot, mostly. Um, so uh, did he keep his uh, persona separate? Um, so when he was outside the ring, he was Frank. And then he, when he was in the ring, he was Bruiser. He didn't intertwine any of them, right? No. So I think that is why he was so successful, because he he never lost sight that he was, first and almost, he was Frank Goodish. His work persona was Bruiser Brody. 
So when he worked, he was Bruiser Brody, exactly what you said. And when he was home, he was uh, Frank Goodish. So I think that, you know, he never lost sight of who he was, which I think helped him a lot because even I have people coming up to me now saying that they remember sitting next to him on a plane or they saw him and they couldn't believe here he is, knowing this, you know, this fearsome-looking gentleman and he's sitting there reading the Wall Street Journal. And then when they talked, he could talk very intelligent to him. And I think that's why they dubbed him. I think he was an intelligent monster in Japan because they knew he had, you know what I mean? He wasn't the same person when he was in the ring as what he would be. And even kids would, they, you know, that have grown up now that sometimes will come to these events that I attend and they'll say, we saw him in the plane, you know, we saw him in the airport. We were so scared. We were hiding behind my dad's legs and he would come up, he would come over and talk to them in his normal voice. And it's funny that even as a child, I remember that today. Um, so how was he as a father? As I said, he he just loved his son. I mean, if he happened to be home and they had one of these school events, you know, where you bring your, bring your dad to school, yeah. he would go. And the teachers, of course, the teachers just loved him. Here he was, this big man, trying to sit in one of these small chairs and hoping not to break it. And he would go. And they knew, you know what I mean? They just... They just uh, loved him, and even when everything happened, they were so kind to Jeff. You know, they let him pick a friend to, you know, go back to school with and everything. So, and then if he could, he would go to, I would always uh, volunteer and do, like, assistant coaching to the baseball and the soccer and everything. And then if Dad was there, he would come and he would take my place and do the assistant coaching, help with the coaching. So... Yeah, his regret was he never got, I know that he never got to spend more time because Jeff was so young. Uh, so when Jeff got a little bit older, um, did he ever thought about following his father's footsteps and training in the ring? No, not, never at all. He didn't want, he didn't, wrestling was like dead to him, to be honest, at that point. Now, of course, he's old enough that he understands, especially after the, uh, especially after the uh, Vice episode of Dark Side of the Ring. He kind of understands a little bit more. He didn't realize just how his father was perceived in the world. And, you know, it's hard for him because he just realizes that he didn't have that time. Oh, I bet. I, I, I wouldn't know. I've never been in his situation. I'd probably be feeling the same way as well. So what were your thoughts about it when Vice did an episode of your husband on Dark Side of the Ring? I think they did a really good job. They were so respectful to me. And I have to give, I mean, five stars. That's, I think, the highest you can give to uh, Evan the producer, and, sorry, and his cohort, Jason. I mean, we went into Texas. Uh, as have you have seen it, they actually got Jeff to talk. This is the first time he's ever done anything in his whole life. People have wanted him to do things, but he's never did. They, because as I said, he got along with them. We had fun with them. It was, I mean, even though it was a, a terrible subject, we had, we had. You know, they gave us a really good time and they actually got Jeff to talk, which I could not believe. That was something that I never thought would happen. And here they were, we were there and they asked Jeff, would you like to do, you know, would you like to talk? And he said, yes. I went, whoa. You know, I said, that's, that's how good they were. And as I said, one of the statements, of course, was they asked him, you know, questions. And one of the answers was, well, everybody knows my dad more than I do you know I was so young and that's true the memories more everybody has more memories of his dad than he has oh I bet and that was you know that was kind of sad but no Vice I'm I'm looking forward to seeing a couple of the other episodes of uh, Vice too I don't know if they've done the Dr. D yet or not David Schultz I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing that one 
Yeah, Doctor. I know David. And- oh, I know David too. Um, I t- um, he calls me up once in a while to see how I'm doing, and it's it's this Tuesday night they're doing the Doctor David Schultz one. Oh, good. They haven't done it yet. Yeah, I'm, I'll make sure I've, I'll get it taped in that. I know I, I, I spent, we did a show in St. Louis together a couple of years ago, and I just had fun with him. <laughs> he was just, he's just a really, uh, really great guy, to me anyway. Yeah, he's a cool dude. He likes to give me a hard time, too. <laughs> um, also, um, when you were married to uh, Bruiser, um, you became uh, good friends with Stan Hansen. Tell me a little bit about you and your relationship with Stan Hansen. Well, Stan, and still today, he we have a good relationship. Because when uh, Frank, we were living, I said we were living out, we were living in San Antonio yeah. at the time, and Frank was working with uh, Paul Bosch. So a lot of times he'd call me up, there would be a plane, he'd work the show in Houston, then he'd get on a plane and come back to San Antonio. They had a 12 o'clock plane that would, that would uh, nonstop to uh, San Antonio. So he would get on that plane. Well, quite a few times uh, he ended up with Stan. Stan would be working the show too. So he would, uh, when I picked him up at the airport, Stan would be there. And you have to remember that Stan and Frank go back to college days. They were roommates in college at West Texas State, where so many great wrestlers have uh, come from. So, so that goes back to then. So I knew Stan. So after everything happened, uh, Stan, I used to put uh, Jeff on a plane and send him. I think Stan was in Jackson, Mississippi back in those days. And I'd put him on a plane and send Jeff to Stan's on the uh, school holidays. And they'd go on these magical road trips get in with him and his kids and everything and they'd go on their road trips and like I said even today we are in touch and we do a lot of shows I meet him a lot of the shows and that so I cannot say enough about Stan Hanson yeah he's a good guy he's I'm one a- of the ones yeah, he's a great uh, he's a great guy. I met him in Chill Coffee, Ohio, when Bobby Fulton had his uh, wrestling promotion going on. I got a chance to meet with him and hear some great stories about him in Japan. Yeah, so yeah, Frank and him that were probably one of the closest friendships that uh, you know Frank had because that that was before wrestling. That's when they played football together. What that was like with I think Terry Funk and all those ones, Manny Fernandez. I mean, all of them were up there in West Texas State. Um, um, since uh, Bruiser would um, go wrestle over in Japan a lot, did he ever tell you some great stories about him uh, um, experiencing uh, the wrestling and the culture over in Japan? Yeah, yes, he uh, really enjoyed J- Japan. He would always tell me, you would never understand what it's like in Japan because they were very, res- well, they're very respectful. And he said the wrestling is so different because it's actual near enough wrestling over there. You have to know to wrestle because the Japanese, they they were really into the fine art more than the showmanship back in those, you know, back then. And he said, you just, you wouldn't believe just how respected compared to what it was going to a show here back in those days than to go over there. He said everything was taken care of, the airport, they'd fly them in, they would take care of everything. And he did say to me, he said, you'll never understand it. Well, when the Japanese promotion got in touch with me after everything that happened and wanted me to go over, I think it wasn't that it was like a, not even a couple of months. It was pretty, sh- pretty close after what happened. Uh, I didn't even hesitate to say yes because I knew that would be the only time that I would ever experience what Frank had experienced. And they were wanting me to fly. I was in still in San Antonio, San Antonio to Houston to Japan, and I said no. I would like to go. San Antonio, Los Angeles, Japan, because that was the route that Frank went every time. I just wanted to do the same thing, yeah. Because this was pretty, pretty new. So I just said, I just wanted to feel that whole experience of how he went. And sure enough, it was, it was an experience over there. And Stan was over there too at the time, and I know it was a great experience. I don't know how much Jeff remembers, 
but I know they he actually had his own little his own little office boy that was with Jeff. I had one and he had one, and Jeff just loved it because he'd go into a store and anything he wanted they would buy for him. And I'm saying, no, I've got to get all this stuff home on a plane. Don't do that. Because if Jeff liked something, it was like, oh, here it is. He's carrying it out the store. <laughs> so no, they were. I am so grateful to. Uh, Baba's organization that we did, you know, when they took me over for the memorial show, I, I can't say enough of the respect that they gave us. Um, also, um, you did a book, too. You were part of a book about your husband's life. Um, when um, that was mentioned to you, uh, was it kind of hard to do it at first? Well, first of all, it started off, I would go... Jeff was in Texas. I'd go to Texas when computers just came in, mm -hmm. and he said, P put Dad's name in the search engine. I put his name in the search engine, and I could not believe the stuff that was in there. A lot of it was not true, you know, because once it's on the Internet, it stays in there, whether it's right or wrong. You know, it's there. And I went, well, gosh, that's didn't think anything off it. Then another person was writing a book. Um, there's another book out there that came out before mine. And I thought, well, no, I don't know this person. I don't know how he's going to put a, you know what I mean? Yeah. Spin on it. So I, he wanted me to be, uh, you know, to put a little something in there. And I said, no, I talked to Larry, Larry Matisak. And Larry said, I wouldn't do it. And I thought, well, no. Well, I'm not going to get into the details of the other book. Yeah. But then after that, Larry said, uh, you know, why don't we do a book? Then we can get the truth out there. No matter what's out there, we can get the truth out. I know everything on the wrestling side. You know the truth on the personal side. Because Larry and, uh, uh, what is it, Frank, had been friends for such a long, long time that they worked together. And, I, I mean, Larry had been in Frank's life for so, just about as long as I had known him. So when Larry approached me, he said, look, we, we would have complete control over what's written in there. And that was why I, you know, that's why I agreed to write the book. So because I, I trusted Larry. Larry was, there's some people in life you can trust, totally. And I knew there wouldn't be any embellishment. It might be from some of the interviewers that he interviewed, but he would pretty much know the right and the wrong. So, yes, I wrote the book, and it was called Brody, The Triumph and Tragedy of Wrestling's Rebel. And I was, it was hard, but it, you know something, it was probably therapeutic because just writing things down, because I'd never really talked about anything before or, you know, done anything like that. I kind of kept, except for the few people that kept in touch with me, I didn't really have anything to do with the wrestling business and that was like I'd lost a family when the re you know when everything happened and then the book kind of opened up after writing everything down and doing that it was it was really helpful and then of course then he started getting the award you know the first one was I the first one was a little show in Dallas that he got an award and then from that one it was the CAC the Cauliflower the Cauliflower Alley Club in uh, Vegas and after being doing those couple of shows it was like I found my family back it opened up the whole thing and now I go they take me to a lot of the events and that's why I get to see all the fans and I get to see and this is what 30 32 years after and he's still so well known out there and some of these events I go to all these people you know one of the ones at the Cauliflower Alley Club which is Anyone that's a fan, you should go. I don't know. We've already been. In fact, today is the day I should be in Vegas. This would be the day that, of course, everything's cancelled. Well, cauliflower is only postponed. I think it's the 21st of September. 21st of September, they've rescheduled. And fingers crossed, everything is back to normal by then. So, yeah, I should be right on my way to Vegas as I'm talking to you. That, but it's a wonderful, wonderful organization for any of the fans that, you know, that are out there that you can, go, a fan can go. It's just you join, it's only like I think $25 a year to join 
the club and then you get a newsletter every, you know, every four weeks, every quarterly, quarterly, you get a newsletter that tells you, you know, about the different people and what's happening and everything. And it benefits, you know, some of the wrestlers that there is no uh, pension in wrestling. So, so what it does, it kind of, uh, some of the old time wrestlers, you know, have any problems, it helps them out. So, it, you know, it's a benefit to the old wrestlers. So it's a great organization. I, I bet it is, because I was going to be going out there for the first time this year, too. Um, I have friends out there like uh, John Cosper, uh, Bob Johnson, which you know as well. And um, I was... Yeah, John. Yeah. And I was going to go out there because um, I'm part of a, um, a wrestling promotion called Future Great Wrestling over here in Cincinnati, Ohio. And last year... Uh, a friend of mine, Cody Hawk, uh, got the award for the uh, Cauliflower Alley Club, uh, you know, Professional Wrestling Trainer of the Year Award. And yeah. and I missed that show, but uh, Cody's like, man, you got to go and uh, check it out. So I was going to be with you. I was going to be at that same place. <laughs> I'll get to meet. Well, are you going to go in September then? Yes, I am. And I hope I see you there and finally get to meet you. <laughs> Oh, I will. Yeah, ever ever since he first got the award, I think it was back. I can't remember too. It's been quite a few years. I I go every year now, and it's just so nice to catch up with everybody and uh, see everybody. And like I said, it's a it's a great organization. And, and speaking of all the events you go to, you went to one. Um, can, um you can tell me a little about. Um, tell me about the Brody Cup. Oh, the Brody Cup in Philadelphia. That. That's where I should have been yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> they had the <laughs> they had the Brody Cup. The Brody Cup was meant number two. Brody Cup number two was meant to be yesterday in Rome, Georgia, and I'm flying flying from Georgia to Las Vegas today. So this is two two events that I'm sorry, you know, that have been postponed. They're not cancelled. They've been postponed right now. So yeah, so this. As I said, the Brody Cup 2 should have already been over. But now I think they're going through their books and they're going to reschedule it as well. So, no, the Brody Cup, when I went to Philadelphia, it, it was it was great. I mean, and he had, I mean, Charlie had, what, Ed Dollar and Stan Hansen and Bobby Fulton. And it was it was a really, uh, it was really good. Charlie did a good job uh, doing it. So I was looking forward to seeing everybody yesterday at the Brody Cup too and I think uh, Tommy Dreamer was the one that got it got it last year man damn that damn virus <laughs> and, <laughs> I know it's really as I said when you think of uh, every everything that has been cancelled or postponed and when you see Vegas it's unbelievable it's unbelievable that we're sitting here and Everything is closed. Vegas is closed. I know they're talking about opening up certain things, but I don't know if we'll ever have... We don't know what the new normal is going to be. Yeah. We're sitting here in our different houses, and uh, we hope for the best, but we we don't know what to expect, so we just have to, you know, accept whatever the future holds now, because there's nothing we can do about it except for stay safe and keep people safe. I I totally agree. I'm um, also a uh, bruiser. Um, um, was he ever reached out by the uh, WWF at one time? Well, he was he was uh, Vince Senior when he was alive, and when Frank was there, he used to call the house a lot. You know, there's no doubt that he uh, Frank would not have finished up working for Vince at the end of his career. I'm pretty sure of that because the one match that everybody wanted was Beauty and the Beach Beast, which was Frank versus Hogan. I know the talk. I mean, people even do pictures that they were having a match, you know, that that would have been the, that would have been the match that people wanted. That, well, people did want to see that match even back then. So, yet there would have, as I said, things changed when Vince Senior passed. Things changed a little bit, and as Frank Bruiser had, his priority was uh, Japan. 
that was what he was protecting right then was Japan. Um, there's another question. And he knew as you get. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. He was getting older too. Yeah, as he was, he was getting older. He was thinking of other things to do besides wrestling. Um, also, you know, when he was not in the ring as well, he was a pretty smart businessman too. Right. He he'd already open. He had already started a corporation called a BAM, which was Brody Athletic Management LLC. And what he was doing, he had bought a wrestling ring from uh, Blanchard in San Antonio. And what he was going to do, he was working with a couple of gentlemen. One of them was a professor at the University of Texas in San Antonio. And they, what they were going to do is they were going to go around the schools. This was in the D.A.R.E. program. You know, the D.A.R.E. program, yeah. the drug program that they have mm-hmm. was really big back in those days. And they were going to get the okay from there. They were going to go to the schools, put a wrestling ring up, and do a skit about the dangers of drugs and alcohol. And who do you think those kids would listen to? They would actually get attention to talk about. Because as we know, kids, you put authority figures, even like parents, they don't listen. They tune out. You put someone like Frank in a ring, he would have had their attention. <laughs> and and also, we also had a little bit of land, uh, I think it was 40 acres way out in the country, and he was going to put like a little club that had an old mobile home and they could put tents up and have a, have a, um, had somewhere in the summer where he could take like disadvantaged boys that didn't have a charm, take them out there and give them the experience of, of, you know, just a little fishing and, you know, things like that and the wrestling and things like that and just kind of help, help the youth, help, you know, boys. But I'm afraid none of this, as we know, didn't take place, but he had great ideas to do. And what most of it was, was to, you know, to help people. He probably would have been a great uh, professional wrestling trainer, too, uh, training young guys who were trying to get into the business as well. Yeah, I would would say that, too. Yeah, he had a whole lot of things that he was, uh, that was on his agenda as he got older, because he knew he did so much in the ring that his body was starting to break down. Like, you talk to a lot of the older wrestling, everybody has replacements, because you can't go in the ring and do what they do, get battered, get beat up, do those high spots, jumping from the top rope, the knee, the hip, the arm, the sh- especially shoulders too, because you're coming down on your shoulder. You know, so he knew that because he did so much for a big man. He did, he did things that I couldn't believe he could do. I couldn't do them. I couldn't put that big, big foot up and get somebody in the face. (laughs) I mean, so yes, he was already prepared for thinking about what to do because that's what it was. That's what when you're a businessman, that's what you do. You you try to have an agenda of everything you want to accomplish and everything you want to do. And okay, my body's breaking down. I better start thinking about other other things. So yeah, that was already in the works. Oh, that would have been great. And, you know, and, and, and like I said, I'm not going to get into that subject at all, but that it, the whole incident was very sad and I'm not going to push it because that's not how I am. I know a lot of people try to push it on you, but I'm not. But like I said, that was very sad and we'll leave it how it is. And so far, I'm enjoying this uh, podcast. Well, good. I'm glad to hear that. And I'm glad I'm going to get to meet you in September, fingers crossed. Yeah, me too. I'm looking forward uh, to it. I mean, because there's a lot of people that go out there every year and spin hounding me going, come on, man, you got to come out here. And, and I'm going to definitely do it. Let's let's hope, you know, this virus gets destroyed and wrestling gets back where it's supposed to be. It'll probably be a little bit different than how it was like what you were talking about earlier on this podcast. We'll, we'll see what happens. I know, as I said, we just have to, it's just kind of like day by day. And as, like I said, it's day by day, it's the same. You either, you either take it seriously and try, try to be part of the solution, you know. 
I mean, I, I know a, a lot of people, and I know it's hard because people have to get back to work and they have to make a living and they've got families and it's, it's kind of heartbreaking to see so much out there. People lined up for food. This is 2020 mm -hmm. in America, all, all over the world. It's not just America. It's everywhere in the world that it's, it's not, you know, sometimes you think about it and it's like, well, it's unbelievable. When you're in your house, you kind of forget. You think things are normal. Then if you have to go out and you see everybody wearing masks and you've got a mask on and, and it's like, it, it's hard to even even believe sometimes that this is happening, that this is, this is our world right now. I totally agree. Um, so where can everybody uh, get your book so uh, people can hear the real true story of Bruiser Brody? Oh, sure, sure. Well, if you send me a message, I'm on Facebook, send me a message. I have copies here that I can sign. I can personally sign them and send them out. So if a lot of people would like, just uh, message me on Facebook. I'm under Barbara Gordish, of course. <laughs> hey, Barbara, thank you so much for coming, um, you know, out of your uh, busy schedule to come and share the story about you and Frank. Well, my pleasure. And uh, like I said, here's to September. Here's uh, to that everything is going to near enough be back to normal by September for everybody. That we're all living the life that we need to live. Yeah. Who knows? Maybe in the future someday, maybe you'll uh, um, go uh, check out more independent pro wrestling shows. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'd love to. That's why I love that little pro, the uh, Brody Cup. That was like a little independent wrestling show. Yeah, um, Texas back in the day when, um, you know, Frank was wrestling and Hanson were wrestling over there. Um, that was a hotbed of professional wrestling, man. Texas was. Oh, I know. And then every year, Herb Simmons, have you heard of Herb Simmons? He's the one. Yep. Herb Simmons does a little show outside of St. Louis in East Condolet. In fact, I'm meant to be there next month, and that one's canceled too. He does a memorial. He does a Brody memorial, and he has been doing it for, well, ever, ever since, since seven, since, yeah, 80, early 90s. And I've gone down there every year. And it's just a little show, and it's like it's an old school show with the guys, away from any of the professionals, but it's like what it used to be in the old days. He's kept it old school. Frank used to work with him forever, like with Larry, and they would go out doing these little shows and being very successful at it, going to places, let, let other people see the wrestling and do it the way that it used to be. So, yeah, and it's it's a, it's a great little, he has a great little wrestling, you know, organization down there and has done it for so many years. So I had the Bruiser Brody Memorial that he does with the Chase Memorial from St. Louis, the same, you know, it's like one of the shows and that's where I met David so Schultz and I've done it with uh, Abdullah the Butcher and he brought Stan down. He brings a name down every year for that little show. Hey, that's pretty cool. I'll definitely have to check that in the future once all this insanity is over. But like I said, it was a pleasure having you on. I really enjoyed it. You really made my day. <laughs> well, thank you. It, it passed the time a little bit. Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you. And thank you for still remembering. One last thing I was going to say. Thank you for still remembering. And for anybody listening out there, the fan, thank you. The family really appreciates it. And everybody else, uh, thank you for listening to Russell Popcast. This is Robin Nelson and Barbara Giddish. Everybody have a great weekend.